since you are the first, your question is good, right? Because, because you put your hand up first, straight up. So we give you four shots. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is David. I'm from the University of Ibadan, where I'm currently studying. I'm here on behalf of Disciples Christian Network, a church in Ibadan. So my question is this. From what I have heard over the days of the, of the session, of the conference, and also what I've read in the book, it seems that the teenagers of the church are the ones that are actually in charge of the connect groups. I want to understand how the church helps to facilitate them and how the connect groups actually function. Thank you very much, sir. Very good question, very good. Uh, yes, let's go into the nuts and bolts. Delegating is not dumping. So when you delegate responsibilities or jobs, to young people, you make sure you set them up for success. Because sometimes when we give out the jobs and responsibilities, um, and if they fail, if they do badly, it will backfire. And then they will start thinking, I'm not made for ministry. So it's very important when you put them as leaders or on the worship team anywhere, you want them to do well. All right, so that's the, the principle that in any empowering, you want to have a system and a structure that uh, they are not alone and thrown into the deep end, but they are set up for success. So for us, and so in every church, you have a different system and structure, but that's the principle behind it. Um, so for us, our structure is in a way that um, there are leaders of one, leaders of three, leaders of seven, leaders of 10, 20, 50, 100. Um, it's the structure of Jethro in the Bible. So, so when you start to lead one, you always have someone hand-holding you, someone sitting next to you. And after that, we do a debrief. And, um, and that person can say, this is good, this you need to improve. Um, and, and if they are faced with a difficult question, like, like explain to me the Holy Trinity, uh, they, we are taught to say, it's okay to say you do not know. You know, just say you do not know. Uh, my leaders will explain to you, or let me get back to you. So, so it's a whole chain, a whole structure of hand-holding. Nobody is left alone and thrown into the deep end. And, and anything that they need help, they can always go up that chain. So I hope that helps you. Uh, wait, where, where is the... Uh, I, I, you're clear. Or you are asking specifically... Yes, sir. Uh, say, say. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the system in itself, right? Reading the book, it seems like the expansion happens so fast. Right, and even, I'm not sure if I even have the right framework to ask the question, but the thing is, the students, right, the church, you said that there is a system of hand-holding, there is a debrief, right? When do these meetings occur? Like, Pastor Charleston's Connect group, it grew to about 1,000, so how do they meet? What is it like? Is it one place, 1,000? I know that there are different group, different people leading um, various units, but how does it work? I, I really want to get that. Well, I love it. You're asking, really, the nuts and bolts. Uh, do you want to? OK, I take it first. Um, you are right. We have every kind of meetings. Um, so there will be one-on-one, -on -one, so like I described. if this. 14-year-old is giving follow-up Bible study, which is a syllabus in a book that we already have. Uh, it's a syllabus. And this older brother or sister who is 19 years old in university, so the debrief happens right after the meeting. Right? So, so there will be debrief after meetings. There will be debrief discipleship, um, right after connect groups. If you preach in a connect group, you will be debriefed. So it's happening 
spontaneously and organically on the ground. Uh, but we also have official leaders' meeting. We also have zone meetings. So the zone leaders might meet their whole zone, the leaders. Um, it could be once in two weeks, once a month. Um, for us, all the leaders in the church, they gather like this in a big group in the auditorium. We meet about once in two months. Um, and, and some of us may think once in two months is a long time. Uh, well, we need to consider that zone level, they are meeting. Connect group leaders, they are level, they are meeting. One-on-one -on -one level, they are meeting. So you can, you can die by meetings. <laughs> so, so we need to plan and not have so many meetings. Um, and then after COVID is wonderful, a lot of meetings are now on Zoom. A lot of meetings are now online. So when we have once a month leaders meeting in a big group like this, uh, sorry, once in two months, the other month that we don't have in person, we do it over Zoom. Uh, a Zoom with like 700 people on Zoom. So, so we try to minimize meeting, but I hope I answer your question that it happens spontaneously, organically, and I feel that is real discipleship. You know, discipleship, I mean, Jesus... Imagine if you ask Jesus the question, when do you have your meetings? Jesus is not saying every Monday, every Saturday. Jesus is saying when I'm journeying, when the disciples are with me over meals. So it's both organic and it both have uh, formal official meetings. I hope I answer your question now. All right, uh, from this side, anybody? All right, right there. Yes. Huh. In the light blue shirt. Yes, you stand it. Yes. Yes. Hello. Good morning. Um, my name is Tunde. I am from Calvary Bible Church. And I pastor children of ages six. But I want to ask um, concerning what Pastor Howe said on the very first day, concerning um, the invasion into the university. Now, my question is, when you first started out, how was the track back? Um, in the sense that when these children um, grow into the university stage, how do you track them back into the ministry. I noticed that over time, when you grow them from the children's church to the preteens, we kind of lose them at the university stage because most of us, most times, do not go back to our mother church. So what is the track back like? Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, before you answer this, so you are not the senior pastor of that church? You are not? Give him the mic. You're, you're not, right? No, sir. So you are teacher in children's church? Yes, sir. So their parents brought them? The parents brought the children? Yes, sir. So it's their parents' church? Yes, sir. So the children are attending their parents' church? Yes, sir. And so they went to look for their own church. That's the answer to that question. From the teaching of Pastor Howe, that's what he said. What you are describing is not the situation where they're in. So as a Nigerian with you, I'm answering the question for you that from his teaching, the, the reason why the track back is not happening is because they came to their parents' church. And so you should do the conversion, whereby the children there take ownership of that church. So because once you get to a certain age, you want to show you are free from your parents. And one of the ways to show you are free from your parents is to look for your own church. All right? So that's the answer. So from what do I say? All right. Come, is Indidi here? She asked a question. She asked me a question. Is Indidi around today? Oh no, no. G give him. Yeah. Praise God. My name is Pastor Wisdom. Yes, sir. I pastor in youth church. Um, I yesterday you, Pastor, how you taught on Ella being humble enough to step down for. Someone. So I want to ask, 
at what point or stage you know, do church leaders know that it is time to step down for a younger generation? <laughs> Secondly, Um, they told me to answer that for you. That's not what this conference is about. It's not about the leaders stepping down for younger generation. It's the inclusion of younger generation into the vital areas. I actually get you, sir. I'm actually going to a place. You know. No, let, let me tell you why. But before you continue, if you use that word "step down," sorry, then, sorry. no, no. What it does is it sends a wrong signal. That's not what this conference is about. It's not a coup. What we're doing, it's an inclusion, all right, and participation. All right, so re rephrase your question. Yeah, thank you, sir. You know, most of the times in this part of the nation, you know, in this part of the world, in Africa, when a church leader is gone, you see the church will begin to decrease in numbers. I don't know if you're getting me, sir. You know, the church will begin to decrease in numbers and all that. So, does it mean that the younger generation have not been impacted enough, you know, to do Yes, what yes, that's what it means. <laughs> all right, the gentleman in... Uh, just one. <laughs> I, I think uh, you can... If you look at the HOGC model, which I'm not saying every church should copy and paste this model is unique to us but you see that we have five senior pastors at the same time so it it the three new senior pastor like pastor garrett he's our reinforcements he's not our replacement so we didn't get kicked out we didn't have to step down like pastor garrett you want me to be gone <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is reinforcements. It is uh, it is uh, working together as a team. So again, to everybody, Pastor Poju is correct. We, you need to be very careful and to pick your words when you go back to your home church. <laughs> yes. I just want to add to that. Um, yeah. Um, since this is my quote, I have to talk a lot more about it. Generations really are, are not replacements, but reinforcements. Um, I often ask, why would we want an older generation to fade away and step down when they have all the experience in the world? Um, because, you see, we say young people, they don't have experience, so they need exposure. Would you really want a person who is constantly just needing exposure to be leading the church alone when he can actively tap on the experience of someone who's gone before? So, yeah, I, I know I'm for young people, but I'm also seeing a waste if an older person just hands off, go away, fade into the sunset, ride the horse, you know, it doesn't work. Whatever that is deposited in the life of a journey with God is so precious. Um, it, it will be my foolishness if I were to be serving under a man and say, or a woman and say, you know, you get out of the way now, it's my time to shine. I need you to pour yourself into me because you have walked further and deeper than I have. And it would be a shame if someone you know, coming after me is throwing me away when I have so much that I can speak into your life. So, reinforcements, it's so beautiful. If you can just get it right and not get anybody out of the way. I know it's hard, but it's workable. I, I, strong, I strongly encourage everyone to go to YouTube, to Covenant Nation website. There's a message I preach called the power of a three-generation church. That is very critical to balance everything that I've talked about. So the glory of the church is when three generations come together in strength and work as a team. 
That's the most powerful church. So the most powerful church is not a youth church. It is not a senior citizen church or a family church. The most powerful church is three generations working together as one church. Thank you. All right, the gents, yeah. The next person has to be a lady after this. So if you're not a lady, all right, okay. All right, yeah. My name is Mark Chuku Eti. I'm the lead pastor of Dr. Life International Church, Makodi Benu State. I, I want to ask a question. Uh, pastor Howe talked about uh, Pastor Leah having the vision for young people and him bringing the system. Okay, I want to ask, how can we deliberately and intentionally develop a heart for young people, knowing that sometimes they don't have the resources and then the, the issue of mess and breaking of things, how can we intentionally develop a heart for them? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, how to develop a heart for the young people? Um, let, me, let me tell you my story in a short way. When I started the church, um, I never thought or dreamed to have a youth church. It was just a regular church. Um, so it was Pastor Lear who had the heart for the young people. For me, young people are just young people. <laughs> Uh, I don't dislike them. I also have no great love. But because being with her, uh, seeing how she loves young people, how she always connects with young people, um, I do not know whether it's a spiritual impartation or it is just a natural influence. Maybe it's both, probably. Uh, I begin to catch the heart for young people. So. I do not know how to answer you, but I think being in a meeting like this, our natural influence, our spiritual impartation, coming to Covenant Nation, coming, be inspired, be motivated. You know, watching a movie like Jesus Revolution, all these is going to help you develop a heart for young people. It doesn't have to be any emotion. If you love the church, you will love young people because your burden is that they will have the timeless truths that we have in our lives right now. So that I want to impart those timeless truths to you so that you can carry on to build the church of God on earth while I'm happy in heaven. Um, it's about a more macro picture. I'm not just loving young people, but if you feel a burden for the church, if you love the church, you will want to love the young people because they are going to be there even when we are long gone. Does that make sense? That's why I want to make sure that when you are there and I'm gone, that you have the real stuff. That, so that's why I'm pouring my life into you. That you have, the, you have the timeless truths. I'm pouring my life into you. So loving young people is just a very microcosm way, I think, of saying that we love the church. We want it to keep going on strong. Does that make sense? Because I'm not sure if I'm making too much sense because I just got off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll take her question behind, then I'm coming to this section, then I'm coming to you people. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Ade Bola from Covenant Connect. So my question is, um, first of all, how do you mobilize your young people for evangelism? Is there a time when you, everybody goes out preach the message of the gospel to bring in new people? Do you mobilize this um, to go like on a rally or something? And then when these um, new people come to church, is there a system for new converts, people that just confess Christ? Is there like a class they move into? Is there a reorientation and then gift of the spirit and understanding spiritual growth and the likes? What's the system like? I understand that the system of integration is um, training them on how to 
be active in church and participate in service. But when it comes down to um, new converts, people that just gave their lives to Christ, and then the system of evangelism, please, that's my question. Thank you. I answer the evangelism part and the good parts you can answer. Um, evangelism, we have two approaches generally on a macro level. We have go and tell. So everybody has a conviction about reaching someone for Christ. We teach that. Uh, um, again, we, my husband talks a lot about it. It is not about outward behavior modification, but it's a genuine burden for souls. Once you put that inside the people, they will naturally go and tell in whatever sphere of life they're in, whatever stage of life. So they will evangelize, they will share, you know, they will like make friends. Then there's the come and see, which is to bring people to the church services weekends or Easter or December, and that's where they come and see your church and they receive Christ in those services. So that's the two macro ways. But the key about evangelism is that, um, again, I cannot begin to emphasize enough, the burden for souls, uh, when it is not a real genuine burden put inside of the heart of people having a revelation of it, it becomes like a, a pestering of people and hounding them to become Christians. Um, it becomes a number target that you have to hit as a connect group leader. So we are very careful to make sure that there is always a constant teaching, uh, inspiring of how important it is to reach people. Yeah, okay, so as you can see, Pastor Lea is the woman of the heart, whereas I'm the person they come for system and structures. Um, your, the answer to your question, are you ready to stay till four in a... <laughs> it's too much. Um, yes, we do have a system. Um, let me share in one minute. Um, we call it our transformational journey, and it is how to take a loss, from loss to leader. So from the day they are a lost sheep, all the way there's a system and a journey that, that leads them uh, to becoming a leader. But obviously, the pace, the speed depends on the response of the per per person. There's no way we can force discipleship or anything. Um, so, oh, where, where do I start? In the beginning, we have this thing called the three I's, which is to incubate, invite, and to integrate. So you incubate uh, and it's biblical work from Genesis, the Holy Spirit hovers over the earth, and that's incubating. Incubating an uh, unchurched or unbeliever, then you invite them to church, and that's not done. Even when they get saved, you've got to integrate them into church, the belonging part. Um, then after that, they start their follow-up Bible study, which is eight weeks or eight lessons. It's supposed to be eight weeks, but some people take eight, eight months. Uh, again, it depends on the pace of the, the person. Uh, and then we have Encounters Night where they receive the gift of the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have all that and then we have Bible studies and then we have uh, basic ministry training where they get trained before they are deployed to serve and then they have leadership training. Yeah, so it's a whole journey. Um, but I want to say this. We only have this system only in the last five to ten years and we are also still developing and improving the system. The most important thing is not system and structure. The most important is you have good leaders and good people. When you have good people and good leaders, even without a system, they will care, they will love the people. So build the people first. Always build the people. And only when your church grows to a certain size, maybe a thousand, two thousand, then of course you need to put in system and structure. Don't worry so much about system and structure. People, people, grow the leaders. Grow the leaders, you will grow your church. So brilliant, Pastor Ha. All right, this side. Uh, okay, I'll take... Did you have your... You've answered your question. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in great. Yeah. Then, after she... Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Aesop Benedict Kujuria from Ghana, the Rory Church. And um, listening for the past two weeks, I can tell that the whole focus is on leadership. I feel once you 
discover a leader, you feel that the success associated to it. And I can see that your inclusiveness, the dynamics associated to it, are all boiled down to building certain leadership. I want to find out that your macro growth, at the end of the day, you gain a micro growth. What are the micro leadership styles you've deployed over time and you've instilled in your youth leaders? So that they can be able to lead a group of 10 to 20 to 30, 2,000. Because at the end of it all, influence is the key factor of what leadership. Once you can influence, you can be able to make the impact. I want to find out once again that how, what are some of the micro leadership styles you've been able to impact into the young ones? Thank you. Um, I'll answer a little bit, but this leadership, you have the best leadership guru here. <laughs> Pastor Poju needs to answer. Um, but yes, just a quick one. You're absolutely right. At every different levels, when you lead five or you lead 500, is, uh, you need a different uh, style. And more than just the numbers, but the age group, when you lead 13 years or teens, when you lead 25 year old, you lead 45 years, it all requires a leadership style. So you're right, leadership style has to be fluid. It cannot be dogmatic. Um, and also, you need to grow in leadership because if you lead five and then you lead 500, it doesn't mean that you spend 100 more hours, uh, 100 more effort. So you got to find a way uh, to, to change your, grow your leadership style. But in a short answer, is that you delegate jobs, responsibility, authority. So at a lower level, you learn to lead in your job scope and delegate in your job scope. Then you teach them responsibility. And finally, you have authority. So I just want to stop here and Pastor Foju might want to add. Pastor, you are the guru. <laughs> All I just want to say is that that's a very good question. No, no, honestly, it shows you are thinking deeply about what you are listening to. Very good question you asked. Very, very good question you asked. That you didn't travel from Ghana for four years. He, he's thinking. All right. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I should answer the question. No, I'll answer. How can I answer the question? <laughs> okay. Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, so I have two questions. Oh, sorry, my name is Amarachi. I go to the Dreamcruiser Church of God. Um, so my question is, one, um, during Pastor Leah's message, she mentioned that we should build people and, no, sorry, don't use the church to build, no, sorry, don't use people to build the church, yeah. So my question is, how do we make people's dreams come true and like build them up if there's no money? This is like, you know, either at like the youth level um, group, groups and stuff like that. And my second question was, how do we then communicate these wonderful things we've learned here to our pastors who are religious? How do we communicate this to them so they can implement this? Uh, you should not think about it deeply. Oh, oh, let, uh, all right, let me, that second part, let, let, me, let me just help this, they will answer, but the second part, when you want to communicate to a leader, particularly in our culture, you can't go with the mindset that I want to tell you something because you are religious. It won't go. And anybody who listened either online or physically here, please don't go back to your church and talk to the leader like you've discovered some superior information that they need to listen to. What you do is that even if it's only 3% of what was said here, your leader practices, you tell him, I heard something you've been trying to do. You get what I'm saying? That you know you mentioned this part. In this particular conference, they seem to have expounded that dream you have in your heart. Can you listen? Do you get what I'm saying here? That's a different way of communicating than telling the person that I've discovered, because if you go and meet a leader and say, I've discovered something, in other words, you are now the Holy Spirit to him, as that's the way he's going to read it, all right? 
So go, don't say you read just with that. Just go in and say, you know, uh, I mean, you, uh, um, just find something he does that is correct. Then leverage on that point and give it to him. All right? Uh huh. Okay. All right. The first question, which I want to give them, how? How do you um, how do you make people's dreams come true? Okay. Without having money. Well, not all dreams need a lot of money. Um, we have this, what we called, um, even though we pick up a lot of broken kids from broken homes uh, in a much earlier phase uh, than now, but we are still picking up broken kids at this stage. But in the earlier days, we have this, what we started as a dream makers night in, uh, during Christmas season, where we know kids from broken homes. They have never had a dream of having a good family dinner together in the warmth of a family context. So we started that, and it doesn't take a lot of money. Uh, we started with us first. We would, in Crover Christmas, make the dreams of the young people come true by inviting them to our home. Very simple meal, but in that meal, it brings a lot. It doesn't need a lot of money but it makes the dream of the young person come to pass because they've never quite have that family context of having a father and a mother figure sitting down with them, having a normal dinner and speaking and affirming them in their lives. It doesn't take a lot of money, but you'll be amazed at how many stories that came back to say, I have never had this and I had longed for it. And it is now I have gone through this. Now I have a reference point of what it means to have a sit-down, complete family meal as a Christian. So it doesn't take a lot of money. Does that answer your question? Good. Yes, it does. It answers my question. All right. Thank you. OK, one more from this person. The, OK, the lady in pink, is that pink? Or red. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Anna from from Ghana. Uh, okay, I want to answer Pastor Lia. She's a pastor, not just a pastor's wife. So I want to ask, <laughs> how are you able to uh, merge together? Because I had a church where um, a pastor, a pastor's wife was. Are you married? <laughs> you are not married. So you intend to marry a pastor because it's a pastor. All right. <laughs> the funny thing is that I don't see a difference in both roles. Well, okay, so maybe, maybe I don't see a difference. It's very seamless for me. Uh, I never had to say, I'm not, <laughs> today I'm your pastor's wife, and tomorrow I'm a pastor in my own calling. Everything merges into one. Maybe you can mark it by seasonal. Say, for example, when he's in a busy season, I would be there supporting him doing whatever he does. And then when I'm busy, he's supporting me in what we do. Like, ex example, we had a daughter. Um, I would take care of the daughter when he's busy, and when I'm busy, he would take care of our daughter. So he releases me to do what I do, and I release him to do what I do. So in that, it works. Uh, that's why I'm not very good for women's conference because I don't know how to answer these questions, babe. <laughs> um, do you have any answers for me? How to be a wife? <laughs> You're asking me.
I think Pastor Toin should answer. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I can answer by telling you how the dynamics of two of us work. I'm not a feminist. Um, I really am not. Um, <laughs> Those claps look like masculine claps. All right. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, I do, I'm submitted to my husband, right? Uh, I do trust his judgment. I mean, I have this little habit that I have, which may, you may find very refreshing, that sometimes I would sit in a car ride home, um, and I call it the passenger seat, because he will drive. I call it my confession chair where I would sit there, and uh, because he's my husband, I trust him, you know, he's my best friend. And I would start telling him things like, you know, I'm thinking this and this and this. Do you think it's wrong? And you know, this and this and this and thing. Do you think I'm in error here? Like, so it is something that I bring to the marriage that I, I'm inviting input into my life. Because I do believe, um, I love a man's judgment. Sometimes they see things that I can't see, and I love it. Uh, then. Also, uh, so th it's that relationship that we have. And sometimes in very important decisions or in decisions that he knows that he needs a little bit more, maybe a spiritual perspective of what I sense in my heart, because that's my gift, uh, he would ask me and, and I would give my input and then we will reach a decision together. So I hope that explains the dynamics between the two of us. So in that sense, I'm a pastor and I'm also a pastor's wife. So I, I can't tell you where the line is drawn. Am I making sense to you, babe? <laughs> I'm hopeless at this. I'm sorry. Okay, Pastor Poju, you were saying, boss, yes. <laughs> okay, let me leave it. Me, I will have asked the question, but let me leave it. But were you called of God before you met him? Sorry? Were you called of God before you met him? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. The gentleman in pink. Abby? You are saying pink people are winning. Basically. Abby, you say, All right. I won't call it. If you're in pink, don't put up your hand again. You don't get it. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. My name is Elio Alves. I'm from Angola. From Angola. It's been a pleasure being here. We attended the three days of the conference. I came with my colleagues. And we'd be blessed to be blessed and honored to be in the house of the Lord. So the question that I have for Pastor Howe and Pastor Leah is that I wanted to know, is there any code of conduct or set of rules that the church has in place that cannot be broken or unwavering? And have any of these changed as the church grew in number? Yes, good question. Um, wow, where do I start? Um, it depends on what you are talking about. I mean, we have safety and security rules. Uh, that's important. And uh, I, I like what uh, Pastor Gottman said yesterday. If you just stop at belonging for young people <laughs> and you don't have any guidelines or, or rules, uh, it's going to be a mess. So, like, for example, we have a rule of three. In other words, uh, no male and female teenager are supposed to go anywhere alone inside the church or outside the church. So it's always a rule of three. So you will never have male and female disciple or leader and, and uh, a member and doing a counseling <laughs> alone, uh, even in church or worse, outside church, worse in somebody's house. So there's always a rule of three, always put three together. And, and in the past, we used to say no male and female, opposite sex. But nowadays, uh, you know, <laughs> even of the same sex, it's, it's, 
Yeah, so there's a problem. <laughs> so, so the rule of three still works. <laughs> when you have three, it's good. So that, that is one of those rules. Um, we have rules like um, the Sunday school children's church teacher, if they are male, they cannot bring a kid to the toilet. You know, basic, simple, practical rules like this. So you need wisdom. Uh, and, and so at, at this point, to all the ladies out there, in this very perverted world that we have descended into, this fallen world, women leaders are the best leaders to lead youth and, and children. You are so needed. Like, like if there's a 13-year-old girl, I can't lead a 13-year-old girl. Uh, Pastor Garrett cannot do it. It's just weird, a male and a 13-year-old girl. But a woman can lead a 13-year-old girl. So, so women are so essential to youth work and children's work now. All right. Um, the gentleman from Angola, how many of you came? Three. All right. So immediately after, uh, once we close, just come right here. I want you to have a private meeting right, with you. Thank you, sir. Because they flew all the way from Angola. Wow. That's, um, that's powerful. All right. Um, if you're in pink, put down your hand. <laughs> OK, join up, up the <laughs> yeah, Put up your hand. All right. Give, um, yeah, we'll go back here. And we'll close in 15 minutes. OK. My name is Miracle, and I, I came from Ibadan for this conference. Uh, <laughs> Ibadan is not far. You don't survive there. <laughs> <laughs> you, will, you will see me after. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll see you. Yes, sir. I'll see you after the service. <laughs> okay, so, uh, all right, sir. So, I, I'm um, from Ibadan, as I said, and <laughs> I serve in the media department of my church, uh, the Disciples Christian Network. And before I ask my question, I really want to appreciate the excellence in the videos that, you know, and the presentations as well. Because I see these things and I've decided, I've seen stuff that myself and my team will go back home and work on and get better in church. So thank you so much. Um, so my question is, in the case um, where you have, you know, members of your church that um, because of traumatic experiences from their past churches, right, just come to church, want to listen to message, the word of God, and just go back home. They don't want to relate to the pastors, the leaders in church, other members, stuff like that. So how, what's the best way that you can advise one to relate with these people? They just, they feel dreaded by church members. They just want to listen and go. So what's the best way to relate to people like that and work on that? And get involved rather, get involved, get them, get them to be involved with church. Yes. I <laughs> You're describing an introvert. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, we can only take people where they want to go. Yeah. Uh, and if we kind of persist into that, we will be infringing, harassment, hassle. People will start to go. I think the essence is having wisdom to know the timing of what to say and when to say, or the next thing that you should do to kind of pull them closer. Um, but in the meantime, you should take the willing and the ones who are really open and approachable and run with them, and in the meantime, still giving time to the person who, is, who just wants not to relate. Um, that's why, I, I, coming back, that's why it's always good to have someone who is slightly older leading a slightly younger person because when someone comes into a church, they find adults very intimidating. It reminds them of some figure that they have to report to, confess to. So that's why I love this whole model of older kids leading younger kids. They would just open up. The youths would tell other youths what they're going through, <laughs> the adults not knowing anything at all. So if you have a younger leader, closer in age, or other youth who are more mature but of the same age, I would think your best bet would be to set those people on him and be his friends, <laughs> rather than we as leaders coming in and intimidating them too much. Would that help? That's powerful, man, powerful. 
Very powerful. Uh, your name is Miracle. <laughs> yes. I think it will take a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Who, who, who is saying that? Uh, it's there. There. It's there. She can't interfere. Yeah, yeah. You, can't, you can't take over the question and answer. You pass it to a leader who will tell me now. You can't say this is a part question. Huh? All right, from this side. Pass me the question. Anybody asking paper question, there's a reason why they're asking. So let me read it. All right. Okay, the lady in white. Why? She's been putting up her hand. Praise the Lord. I'm Beatrice on Art Ministry in my house with six. But now, some of them are in school, some are working and waiting to enter into higher institutions. My question is, how do I bring, so th those are my so, so, pastor, yeah. So how do I bring them together to form a structure so as for this ministry to move on very well? Because right now, somehow I too was like doubting my uh, calling or dream based on today's teaching. Because at the time, we were giving quick news in our... All right, okay. But suddenly now we have, God gave us a better place. So how to bring the first generation and... Since... And to how to... Sorry, I don't understand. No, the mic is going off. It's a bit of mic. Are you sure they, that's what she said? Because she said they got another place. All right. She said she had a small group of six people in her house, and um, they, they, have out, they have gone out, all right, <laughs> to school. So how does she bring, how does she organize? online ministry I have I have other generation we are up to 40 now uh -huh. so but th those are my first generation I'm oh. from the teaching that also to I'm um, to bring them back oh, now I, my get what, generation I get what she said all right I get what you're saying now uh -huh. what she's saying so she's saying that she has let's, let's say she has a fellowship in her house and the first generation have gone but now that she's learned about generations, she now has younger people. How does she get those people who are first generation? Like your nine stones, her own nine stones have scattered. <laughs> so she wants, she wants her nine stones back to come and help her to impart. So follow me now. They, yeah, they've, they've gone to other places, I guess. <laughs> she wants a restoration of her nine stones. Is there any way she can? Isn't that, what, isn't that what it is? That's what it is now. Yes. To so follow me and do the work. Uh, yes, I've explained your point now. <laughs> it, it, so if I understand correctly, the, the nine stones of two, six stones. <laughs> um, oh, how do I answer that? Um, if, if they're gone... Um, you have to pray and persuade them to come back 
And if not, you start again. You start again. You start again. You, start again. you never give up. Yes. And, uh, but you are right. Um, in one, your question is good. Uh, the way generations work is that you must try to keep um, the first, second, third generation in the house because that will build the momentum. Um, so I, I do understand. I have pastors telling me I'm in a small city. And the young people, they grow up, they go to the big cities for university, uh, for work. And because of economy, because of jobs, and I have no answer for that. Um, it is tough. It is tough. So that's why now uh, a lot of my, uh, my counsel is that you, you, if you can, you know, generations churches should be built. Uh, near universities, near cities where mm. you have jobs, where you have uh, schools, um, that will definitely accelerate the building of, of generations. And then you send the on-fire young men and young women into the smaller cities to evangelize. So to me, I see generations working much better in cities close to universities, and then um, the sending out young people to the, to the outposts. Um, I just want to encourage the lady over there who asked the question. You obviously had done a great work and the anointing is still on you to keep doing what you do. Um, I, I'm turning 54 soon, but I still love young people and I sense that could be what you have and that, that doesn't die and um, just have faith um, that you can still do it and if they don't come back you start another generation all right yeah it's still on you yeah e even the nine stones we have right now we have one two three like four four left the other five are not in church they're backslidden so we just keep we have to keep doing it all right two more questions from here yeah in pink <laughs> Yeah, in pink. <laughs> Is there anybody from the back? All right, so I'll take you, you. I'll take, yes, and I'll take the guy in blue, in glasses. Yeah, in glasses, behind. Yes, you. Yes, you, get up. Uh -huh. You're giving up. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, thank you very much, sir. This is my second time asking a question here. <laughs> Don't. I hugs on the first day. Uh, no, no, so no, no, we shouldn't so give you. Wait, 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 we shouldn't give you. We should give somebody else. Come on. Sir, uh, no, concerning should... today. Huh? Concerning today. Did today. you ask on the first day? Uh, shared it. Shared it for somebody. Share. Sharing is love. Okay, Share. I would give someone. Give someone else. Okay. All right, sorry. the guy in... behind. You've already asked now. Um, thank you, Pastor. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things for me is really seeing young people, 14-year-old, 15-year-old, already mentoring and discipling younger people. So my question is for someone that is building a small group of you know, people and the survival of the group is dependent on raising new leaders within a very short time. So my question is from how you began and what you have learned over the years. How, what's, what's, what's your advice on how to build a system where you can actually raise leader quickly? For example, a simple community group, three months, four months, and you need to have a model of creating leaders out of that so that the community will survive. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good question. but. There is no way you can raise the leaders quickly. There's no shortcut. People and leaders are, are not like plants. You, 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 you're not trees. Uh, you, ha you have to grow them. It takes time. Uh, it takes a long time. So, so it, it is not that we take one leader and kind of put in spiritual steroids and make them into like <laughs> Superman. 
Uh, it's just that we do a lot of it. So instead of raising two leaders and put all your hopes and dreams on the two, we raise up 200. And you, so we spend a lot of time with a lot of leaders and out of the 200, maybe 50% will rise. Uh, maybe some will take a long time. So you just have to do a lot of it. There's no fast way, but you can do it in a wide way. Uh, we are, all of us, uh, we are into microwaving, but God is really into marinating. So there's no quick um, solution to that. People must be grown and like you say, the amount of time spent, you will get a certain, uh, you know, growth rate of leaders. But maybe to answer it on a very practical level, uh, in order to kind of a little bit of quickening the pace of the multiplication of leaders, one principle my husband and I have <clears throat> is that we never waste a training. We never waste a training. So if I'm discipling somebody, uh, or talking to somebody, I will always bring a more mature leader in to see how I'm doing it, or two leaders in, so that in the process, I'm training two other people to do what I do. Yeah. So never waste your trainings, especially if you're already at a very high level of uh, leadership in your church, you are very precious uh, in what you are doing. So don't waste that. Bring in people to observe you, bring in people to notice what you're doing so that they themselves can duplicate and replicate what they do with three other people. Is, is that, does that help you? Yeah, that, that is a little bit of a tweaking of our approach to training. Yeah, we love to train at Heart of God Church. Yeah. All right, one more question. Uh, pastors here, yeah, none of you have a question. We need a pastoral question now. Pastors, senior pastors. You have a question. All right, then. Let me tell you this. When I was on campus, that was my best friend on campus, University of Lagos. We used to go and pray in the field together 5 a.m. every day. Some of you know him as Uncle Shola on social media. You, why are you looking quietly? All right, ask your question. I just wanted to introduce you. I do I didn't uh, clap now. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is directed to Pastor Lea. Uh, what particularly got my attention was bus incident. What? The bus incident. Okay, the bus incident. The bus incident. The bus. And, uh, bus. And like the Esther. Uh -huh. uh, yes, yes. When it happened, the following song, what did you say? Cash. When it happened the following Sunday, what did you say to the people? When it happened the last I know, what do you what do we do? How did you motivate the congregation? And also how did you handle the hurt and the pain you know that was coming through? Because it's not only the keys that were hurt, you also were hurt. So how did you find the strength to speak? Speak to them the following Sunday. Um, wow, it's too, very long ago. Good it's question. Twenty-three years ago. So, um, but I, yeah. I honestly, we did not know what to do. <laughs> so, so sometimes people think, expect the pastors to have all the answers, or like we know what to do. Um, or we, the Lord spoke to us, but I, I just want to be raw and real with all of you. I didn't know what to do, and I'm not even sure if I did it the, the wisest way. We, we were trying to survive, and, and I, I guess the lesson or the, the takeaway for everyone here is that even when you mess up in the crisis, God is bigger than your mess. Even if you make mistakes, and even if you do not know what to do, but you just show up and you just do your best with sincere hearts. You know, even if you are not trained in crisis management, in PR, in 
image consultant in branding, you just go with simplicity and share your heart and be real with the people. And um, even if you make mistakes, like God is bigger than our mistakes. Yes. Yeah, that's what I can say. I suppose you. Um, or? A quick one, Pastor. Um, I guess uh, I can remember. It's been 23 years. The hurt is still there, but my memory is a bit vague. But I do recall um, gathering the young people because it was their friends. They were very close. And, and ministering to them and really um, calming them down. And I do recall that I did, I did, it, it, I, um, they were shocked and that you know, a life just ended prematurely in that way. And I felt like it was a very good opportunity for me to be sight comforting them and assuring them that God is a good God, that they need to understand what they want to do with their lives. Um, I think it was a teaching lesson um, in a very painful way, but yet it was a time to, to get them to see the realities of life and decide where they want to go with it because it was their friends. And these things happen, so what about your life? Does that make sense? That um, I turn it into an opportunity where I not only minister to them, but I, I challenge them about where their lives are going. That's it. Yeah. And that's why Pastor Garrett, you know, a whole band of them, they saw everything. In fact, some of them saw the, the bus going over the kids. I only came after. So, <laughs> yeah. But maybe we are wiser now. We would have a plan. But when we were only like 20 something, yeah. 30, 31. Uh, we, we didn't know how to conduct a funeral. You know, they don't teach you to conduct a funeral in Bible school, you know. And so we didn't know what to do. And the first funeral was a tragic accident too. And there was only two of us. So we each had to go to a different funeral. When we went to the funeral, the undertaker or the funeral people, they sent the bodies to the wrong funeral. <laughs> so the parents came and like, that's not my daughter. It was, it was a mess. So if you ask me what I did, I don't know. It, it was a mess. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll just take questions that they sent in uh, quick fire questions. Uh, this person is saying that in your analogy there, uh, how do you ensure that the committed are not infected by the crowd? The committed? Are not infected by the crowd. By the crowd. By the crowd, okay. How, how the com committed are not... Uh, by the crowd. Affected by the crowd. Oh, based on the Rick yeah. Warren... Oh no, the, yeah. the purpose-driven church concentric circles. That's leadership, love is yours. <laughs> you see what she just did? She just passed the question to me. <laughs> should I? That's leadership. That's the person you should answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to learn to let's hear what it is. I will submit to Pastor Poju and I will submit to my wife. <laughs> um, that's a, okay, it's jokes aside, very good question. How do you not let the committed be affected by the crowd? Um, I think I, I spoke about it yesterday about culture. Um, you, you want to build uh, a strong culture in your committed and the crowd, you should just try your best. So the way I see it, we see it, is that we build, we are building a church within a church. Exactly like how you look at the concentric circles. Um, I know the Bible says make disciples of all, but the crowd, they are not ready to be made disciples. They are believers, they, they attend. So we focus our energies and our time and our resources on the committed. And when the crowd, we kind of switch on our radars. And when they are ready to take the next step, then we start discipling them. So we put our energies and resources on the co committed and we build them. So I think what you need to do is to make sure you have a way to turn on that radar that anyone who start responding in the altar call, responding in any way, then you got to get them into 
the committed. That's what we do. Mm. Second quick question is someone is asking on astrology. On what? Astrology. Astrology. Yeah. Okay. So how do you make sure people stay in the word? I think it's because young people are getting very big on astrology now. Astrology as in the stars. Yeah, and um, it's all the act signs. Will I, I'll be correct, right? Okay. I'll be, I'll be right now. Being when, when, when Jesus was born, we don't follow the stars. The stars follows Jesus, right? So why look at the stars when you can look at Jesus? You know, right? Christmas. Jesus didn't follow the stars. The stars follow Jesus. The universe follows Jesus. Jesus is the center. Jesus is the star. Yeah. <laughs> I will ask this question. I will ask it. As a youth in the choir, what do you do when they look down on you? Say one more time. As a youth in the choir, what do you do when they look down on you? As a youth, how? No, so, so they're saying a young person joins the choir, and let's say we're doing integration now, and we bring youth into the choir, and they're looking down on you as a young person, because the older ones there. They, they're looking down on the They're looking person. down. Uh, Move. <laughs> when, is it or I think. I think by asking the question, we have solved the problem. <laughs> Some people feel that they are not allowing them, young people, room to be able to express themselves. That's what they're saying. So what do you do when older people are not cooperative? What do you do when older people are not cooperative? <laughs> We need another conference, Pastor Pochi. Bring them to the conference. <laughs> I think same as everything else. You do your best where you are, and you are accountable to the Lord. You obey the Lord. It's not about the people's um, validation or affirmation. Um, yeah, you just keep doing it even though you have resistance because uh, persistence will break resistance. And by your testimony, by your character, you will win um, people over. Yeah, there's no, again, there's no shortcut. You just, you just keep doing it. Yeah. All right. Um, somebody asked, in your Easter conference, you said you had three different... Um, vibes, vibes. Yes. So there were three distinct services. There were three? Yes, yes. Okay. With different age groups? N not different age groups, different okay, styles. Different styles. Yeah. All right. So you, so you had one at one time, then another time, and another time? Yes, okay. yes. Three different timings. No, it may not be the same day. It may no, be. okay. So, so Easter is three days for our Singapore. Yeah. So we have six services, two on each day. Okay. Yeah, and and we didn't for the first time, we didn't put it by cut it by age. We cut it by vibes. Um, so this style is more homely, warm. This is very edgy. And let the young people, and even the adults, choose. let them choose which one do you want to go to. So I mean, and, but then naturally the adults, the family will choose the homely, warm service. The, the university students will choose the DJ set and the, the edgy service. Yeah, so, so we kind of let them choose. But there actually are youths who like the homely style. No, yeah, yeah. So they, they will go to the, the more calm. calm services, yeah? Yeah, because you, you, these days are so different. So you have the IT computer geek. You have the nerdy kids. You have the, uh, the, the very, they, they love to read. 
and, and he'll put them with the kids who are super cool. Then, in all, when we make the kids who are super cool and have tats and like, look good, and when they feel at home in the DJ set, the computer nerds and the, the people who love to read, then they feel out of place. Then they feel not at home, you see? So, so when we say you want to have, make, build a home for use, there's so many different kinds of use. So that's why we want those who are nerdy and geeky, they feel at home in this service. And they don't have to compare themselves with the, like, like last night, what we have Gritman. I mean, he is so cool, right? Even when I stand next to him, I feel like, wow, you are so good looking, you are so cool. So, so there are some kids who don't feel cool. So, so we, it, we, we let them decide where you want to go. I think. Uh, yeah, let me uh, finish this. See, the last thing you want, I do not know how high school is like here, secondary school. But in secondary school, um, I don't know, I have felt out of place. Like, oh, the cool people are here. I'm not cool enough. I'm not the popular guy. I'm not the captain of the football team. So I, in high school, I feel like, oh, I'm, I'm not cool enough. I don't belong. You know, they are the popular kids. The last thing we want is for the kids to come to church and feel the same thing. So that's why we have different vibes. I hope that, under, you know, the why before that. Uh, we only did it uh, recently uh, when we have the resources and also when we have enough uh, critical mass of cool kids. When, when we, before that, we just ran youth services for all kinds of youth. But again, it is very fluid. I think leadership is very fluid. It, it really, you need to have a finger on the pulse of the church. What kind of people are we attracting right now? And the pastor's heart in you will go, I don't want to exclude anybody. And now that we are able to uh, have the resources, the manpower, then we kind of like say, we want to, we're reaching youth, but we want to add on at, at another dimension of just catering, especially for the creative people who might feel like this church is too filled with you know, readers and bookworms and they, so that's where we were. It kind of, it kind of evolved into that. But initially when we first started, it was just all kinds of youth in one service. Yeah, so we didn't have three services of different vibes. I mean, but we have three groups. So in the connect groups, the same kind of kids hang together. Yeah. As long, the principle is, as long as they feel comfortable, do whatever it takes for them to stay in church. Thank you very much. We have come to the end. Let's put our hands together for Pastor Howe and Pastor Lair.